kind of, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Anne Marie. <laughs> Hi, Jean. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, I, I want to I want to start by asking about the role, how how you see the private sector and the social sector uh, in a larger um, in a larger frame. I've just written a column for the Financial Times talking about a new ecosystem for solving public problems. And that's, that's what we do here, right? We're policy wonks. Uh, policy is one way you solve public problems, the problems of workforce, the problems of education, whatever they are. Uh, and just to set the stage, uh, back in uh, 2006, you wrote an article uh, with First Lady Laura Bush uh, and with former President Bill Clinton, so it's an interesting array there, and you said, the private sector can lead with innovation and capital. Nonprofit uh, groups can apply solutions where they're needed most, and governments can help expand those solutions on a global scale. So I wanted to start by saying, do you still think that, or how would you frame that today? That was 2006, we're 10 years on, you get to, to modify or, or revise. Great place to start. <laughs> and by the way, I want to thank you for your leadership, Anne-Marie, but also for the important role that New America plays in vetting out some of these things where we bring different ideas together, different sides of the table, et cetera. So you heard um, I got started in the private sector, um, but in understanding my private sector role, when we looked at AOL, was it a business? It was. But its primary mission really was to democratize access to ideas and information and communications. And it was really, at the end of the day, a community business. And I think from that perch, we looked across, we were here in Washington, and we looked across society, and we did see sort of a divide between business, government, and nonprofits. And I think we became very animated with the idea of what it might look like if all those oars could be kind of rowing together each taking advantage of their own strengths, but really in more of a collaborative, big bet vision kind of way as we deal with the daunting challenges. So following that article, the following year, we uh, did some important work around sort of what we call citizens at the center, or citizen engagement in solving problems. That then went on to lead to a summit on innovation that we did working with the White House. And the whole point ties in very closely with some of the themes we're going to see coming out of this conference. You know, when I came from the private sector into what we call the social sector, I looked around the table as we were devising ideas and plans and too often didn't see the very people we were trying to serve, yes. didn't see them at the table, didn't hear their voice in the mix, and yet they were the ones living the problems or the challenges. And so I think that really struck us. And this really is what inspired this work around citizen-centered approaches. And you know, so we did this summit on innovation with the White House. The president wrote a, a, a presidential order compelling the agencies to engage citizens as they looked at the challenges that they were trying to address. Out of that came something some of you may know today called challenge.gov where at any given time there are hundreds of challenges that are put out across the nation from the agencies saying, you know what, chances are the smartest people you know, in the world aren't in our room where we're devising these things, and chances are citizens know these problems better than we do sitting under fluorescent lights either at a nonprofit you know, or at the government. And so challenge.gov throws challenges out there. We've had some really great stories around citizen engagements that have just led to amazing innovations. So I have to say, it is stunning in a conference on the next social contract to hear you say, so our, our innovation was to encourage government to talk to citizens about solving their problems, right? right. If there's supposed to be a social contract. Right, exactly. It should you, start with that, It right? should start with that. Yes. that. That tells you something really fundamental about right. how the policy ecosystem is, is, is apart from, right. from the people you, you want to serve. So government, so government, if there is a solution, government can scale it. Yes. You said government can engage citizens in, in developing solutions. Can government itself innovate? Is there yes, a... Yes, no question. They can and they have. Again, going back to my sort of chops in the private sector, we have the internet because of the government, right? We have so many things, so much in aerospace we owe to the good work of DARPA and others. This kind of innovation continues today. But I must tell you, you know, we just had, uh, we just heard a long talk about policy and the role of policy. 
And I think the work that we've been engaged in around policy as we've looked at how do we sort of drive solutions forward, we think of policy as an empowering framework. And encouragement. And too often, if you begin the conversation by saying it's rules and regulations, you've kind of, you know, you've, you've lost half your audience to a certain extent. Because our work, particularly in trying to drive innovation, and these innovations focused on key daunting challenges out in our communities, we've used policy as an important tool as to how we build and encourage the right actions in communities. And so I think too often when citizens, when organizations think about policy, they think this, right? They think it's very limiting, it's telling me what I have to, more importantly, what I can't do. And we're saying, hey, don't look at it that way. It is a powerful tool if you can find certain ways to leverage the strength and what government is best at to enable good things to happen. Thank you. So, that, and, and that is, I think, one of the things a new social contract has to do, or the next social contract has to do, is to, to move past a vision of, of uh, public problem solving only as law and regulation. Absolutely. Uh, and, as, as you say, as a, an empowering framework. Uh, you, the Case Foundation does a lot of work around the country. So you're, you are way And around the world. The, and around the world. Yes. yes. I'm sorry for the- That's uh, all right. Uh, Talk about some of the places you see the sectors working together and innovating, some of the bright spots that, that you have sure. identified and are, are amplifying. Sure, well, you know, there's this new movement some of you might be quite familiar with called impact investing. And really the whole idea is a new class of entrepreneurs and a new generation of companies coming forward that are specifically focused on social impacts in the core businesses that they do. Well, going back to policy being empowering, um, the G8 uh, put a task force together on impact investing and I had the privilege of serving on the US advisory board to that um, task force that was global. Um, and there, what we simply did was looked at policy opportunities that could help this sort of growing trend of companies who at the end of the day are focused on ESG, good treatment of workers, you know, addressing things like education, transportation, energy. We could go right down the list of really significant sectors that affect how we live every day, our quality of life, and bring benefit to citizens. So we put together a number of different policy recommendations that um, we announced at the White House less than two years ago. And when we kind of put them together, they were very aspirational. It's like, wow, if we could get to this place, maybe things could really begin to change here. So you know, I tend to be maybe too optimistic in most cases, and I thought, Three to five years, we'd be like so happy if we could get these underway. But what's happened is inside of 18 months, those policy changes have been enacted. And I'll give you one example. Um, in pension funds, who are huge sources of capital, okay, for new innovation and for new companies, et cetera, they were not even able to consider impacts when they made their investments. Now consider that you know many pension companies would love to align everything they have with the benefit of their pensioners or the communities that they serve, but they were specifically restricted by policy to do that. So now you've got two funds you could invest in. They both are showing promise. You can't even consider if this one might benefit your class more. So that policy got changed uh, in the fall. I was with the Secretary of Labor in New York to announce that. And we expect some really dramatic changes to come forward. New capital going to these kind of companies that can benefit society. And so I have to, ta I have to use that moment for a commercial break for Bretton Woods to uh, the, a New America program that is it, that that policy change enables. So it's a, it, it, Tamika Tilleman leads it, and it's an effort to get the major asset managers around the world to commit up to 1% of their investments in the social sector, in impact investing, in development finance, and civil society finance. And that change has been essential uh, for, to make that something they can do, and consumers or, or investors, I should say, can then, can then look at that. So it is a great example, in that case, of a small regulatory change, which many people in this room know how important to find, you know, to get yes. down to that little lever, turn, change that, and all, all that, right. that comes open. Right. Which is, um, so, uh, 
in terms of specific uh, social impact investments, or maybe let me let me draw let me bring you more to the United States. Sure. Are there specific cities that you see, or or, or regions that are doing? Particularly yeah. Innovative so you know, work? talking about this crossover between nonprofits, and I would you know add philanthropy, government, and business. You know, it's very exciting how some of the cities who've truly hit the wall. So we could talk about Detroit, for instance. What's happening in Detroit is a strategic plan that was put together by that combination of sectors around a table together along with citizens, okay? And, and as you see the new Detroit play out, it's really coming from a shared collaborative vision of what the new Detroit needs to be. And, you know, I, in fact, I'm so impressed by it that a couple of years ago, I took our entire Senior Case Foundation team and we did a delegation to Detroit. Now, normally we'd be going to like, you know, Rwanda or something to look at what's going on there. But in this case, we felt like it's so important to be paying attention to this new model in America today that we really needed to see up close and personal what was going on. And I think a lot of people aren't aware that Detroit is on the move. You know, and Detroit was once a really great city in this nation. Not that it isn't today, it still is. But I mean an extraordinary city. In the 50s, if you were an engineer in America, there was one place you wanted to be, and that was Detroit, Michigan. Silicon Valley was mostly a peach orchard at that point, okay? It was a, the car industry was all of that. It was the Silicon Valley of its day. You know, it lost a lot of things it had going for it. There were some really bad policies. Business did, you know, make some bad decisions, et cetera. And, you know, ultimately the, the city struggled. But it's been really beautiful to see the collaboration that's trying to bring it back. It's, I love that. Uh, 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 and I love the idea of, again, this bottom up, uh, participation, so a collaborative vision exactly. uh, is, right. is exa not City Hall fixing it, but rather bringing together all the sectors uh, and figuring out a shared vision that, that people are, are uh, committed to. Right. So you've, we've talked a little bit about, um, the, as you just said, as you were describing that, you said philanthropy and nonprofits, and I think that is important. We often talk about the civic sector, the yeah. social sector. There are lots of different players, right? right. They're, the, they're the philanthropists, the foundations, they're the <laughs> advocacy organizations, they're the research organizations like we are. It, it's a very diverse uh, sector. And in 2012, uh, so in 2012, you wrote an, another article in the Stanford uh, Social Innovation Wow, this Review. is like, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, but this one, this one I have to say, um, hit home for me right now, so which is why I wanted to ask you about it. So you, you essentially apply the startup philosophy uh, to philanthropy and, and to nonprofits. So the, the idea of, you know, think big, experiment early and often, iterate, uh, and make <clears throat> failure matter. I'm gonna come back to that. So make, so you're gonna, you're gonna right. try things, you're gonna fail, you're gonna <clears throat> learn from your failure, and, and you, argue, you know, this is how we should be thinking in the nonprofit sector, either giving money or yes. taking money. Yes. So I have to say, I, I looked at this and I loved it, uh, but I was reminded uh, of when Secretary Clinton briefly thought about having a reward at the State Department for failure, for the entity, the part of the State Department that had failed. And it, her point was exactly, we need to encourage risk taking, we need all of this. And Absolutely. then somebody sort of said, you remember Senator Proxmire's uh, awards. So let, let's just imagine how that plays out in the Washington Post. Yes, the Secretary of State is giving an award for who has failed the best with taxpayer money. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't translate. And the foundations who support us, who are wonderful, don't always think that taking their money and failing with it is the best thing to do. So I wanted to ask you, you know, how do you, you know, this big, hairy, audacious yes. goals, how do you actually change the culture right, to make right. that happen? Well, we've obviously been at it for some number of years now, and what Anne-Marie is referring to is sort of a campaign that it was started as a campaign called Be Fearless. And essentially, it was calling the social sector to really adopt more of the kind of principles that you see that are present when innovation happens, OK? Now, let me just sort of set the stage for you a little bit. Um, and we have a very diverse audience. You know, I have often said, if I'm spending my $100 I can be wild and crazy. I can do whatever I want. I can decide my own risk tolerance or whatever it is. But if you give me your $100, suddenly I'm going to grow really conservative with it. Think about a couple of sectors. 
Government is somebody else's money. It's yeah. taxpayer dollars, right? Nonprofits, they get grants from organizations. Philanthropies, most of the larger established phil philanthropies not only have someone else's money they're now managing, but someone else's legacy and reputation. And so I think without meaning to, this led to a really, really conservative way of going forward. But when you think about it, shouldn't philanthropy be the highest risk capital? Because we're taking on the greatest challenges that exist in the world. But I could also understand at a very human level, in government, if you take a risk and fail, it's called waste, fraud, and abuse. Yes. OK, no one <laughs> says, oh, that innovative effort didn't really play out, right? Next thing you know, you're going to have hearings. And so I think part of it was yes. true. Exactly. So, so part of it is really just coming to terms with the fact that, guess what? But innovation does not happen without risk taking. But I wrote, since you're going through my life, I wrote another blog just two weeks ago that oh, said nice. how to de-risk risk. And essentially, if you think about risk as R&D, trying new things, piloting, well, guess what? In, in those realms, you actually don't expect that you're going to hit a lot of them out of the park. What you're really trying to do is try new things on the hope that maybe one scores. And I think if we could just flip the mindset a little bit that no matter what the institution is, no matter what sector they're in, if they're trying to innovate, they're going to have to take risks. Let's call it R&D. And if they're taking risks, there is a chance they may fail. You have to grow comfortable with that and not you know, sort of beat them over the head when it happens. But the more important thing is we say fail fast and fail forward. And the idea of that is move on and make sure you and hopefully people who come behind you have learned something because of the failure. Most entrepreneurs, and we hang with entrepreneurs all the time, it's a big part of our investment, both personally and at the foundation. You know, it's actually not something you hang your head over if you're on your fourth startup because the first three failed. I'm more inclined to invest in an entrepreneur who's on his fourth than I am the one that's out there on their first. Why? Because I think failure has taught them a lot and they're better off for it. Um, and so it's just a well understood kind of way of thinking in the entrepreneurial space where we see so much innovation and it's a little bit more foreign in established sectors. So as, so as you were talking, I was thinking, this is my parenting philosophy, right? <laughs> Which is not, oh, please go out and fail. But it is definitely, of course you're going to fail. That's not right. the issue. The issue is, so you, the fact that you failed meant that you tried. Right. And, and what is often hardest, actually, is getting your kids to try. Right. Not, uh, and, and it's because they're so, so, so afraid to fail. Uh, so I want to push you a little further on that. Does that mean, then, greater support for unrestricted Spending. So one of the things that's happened, of course, is that that conservatism means you want to run. You want to be very clear what you're investing in. You want metrics. You want to, to mm -hmm. be, uh, you know, very clear about what the deliverables are. All of that, which right. I, I I fully understand. But it means there's no room to Absolutely. try something and fall on your face. I mean, that that has there has yes. to be a certain amount of unrestricted funding. And for every organization, you know, and I spend a lot of time with boards, and we spend a lot of time sort of, sort of almost teaching, if you will, some of the be fearless approaches. Um, you know, what, what that really means is you have to understand your own risk tolerance. And so for some organizations, they're so far over on the conservative, you know, have to have the data, have to have every T crossed, I dotted. Um, we say, okay, could you try one thing? Could you dedicate 1% of your budget? And we say we have a love-hate relationship with data. We love data just like anybody else. And nothing is better than having uh, confidence because you've looked at data and you know where to go. But that's not innovation. If you have the data, that's not innovation. Innovation is when you don't actually know what's going to happen because you're trying something new. And in that case, we say we are the data. We will become the data through what we do, OK? And so when you look at how to sort of take these principles and apply them to a budget or to an organizational approach, you can say, well, some percentage is the sure thing, where we have the data and you know, there's enough research to tell us we're on the right track. A small percentage in every organization has to decide what that looks like you know, for their own sort of risk tolerance level. Should really be, we are in pilot mode here. We are in R&D mode here. We don't have data to guide us. And there's a kumbaya moment 
where we know that and no one gets fired when it doesn't work. Or, you know what I'm saying? And I think those are really healthy conversations that we've really been trying to have with our sector. Um, and I can tell you, in the four years that we've been at this, and we've had a beautiful collaborative that's come alongside, it's quite striking to see what's happened in philanthropy because of it. Meaning that uh, different foundations are coming together. No question. And we talk openly now about innovative approaches and being intentional in trying new things and taking risks. So shift gears for a moment and, and think about one way of, of thinking about the work you've done and other uh, foundations are doing is they're finding lots of examples of stuff that is great. Yes, right. And, right. and we, you know, we now. Uh, really, over my lifetime, you've had this explosion of NGOs. You know, anybody, you know, and their roommate could create an NGO. Uh, lots yeah, there's and lots a lot of them. Of smaller <laughs> ones, of civic enterprise, of, of entrepre civic entrepreneurs on the ground. Uh, the, the problem with that then is how do they scale? Mm -hmm. And that's something you've thought about, a lot of us have thought about. And one approach uh, that I find uh, particularly exciting in various ways. And I just was reading Sally Osberg and Roger Martin's book on social, enter social enterprise uh, called Beyond Better and, and talking about scale as building networks, right? Yeah, so instead no of one organization that becomes enormous, you find a bunch of organizations and you link them together right. as a network. So I wanted to ask you about that and specifically, what yeah. does it take to make the network go? In right. other words, if you're going to actually assume, all right, these, there are a bunch of different organizations. They're all doing social impact work of some kind or other. I'm going to link them together, but how do you make that at an actual ongoing concern rather than just a dead database? Yeah, so I think, again, you know, organizations, institutions have to embrace it as an approach, meaning they're checking themselves as they take something on. What is our network effect going to be, and who do we need to partner with? You know, partnerships, in particularly, in the nonprofit world um, have been harder to come by because there's this sense that we're all fighting for the same dollar. <laughs> but I do, I feel better in recent years that there's an awakening to the fact that you know, we can be stronger together even if we don't have 100% of the pie. At the Case Foundation, our approach is absolutely cross-sector. Cross so for every major initiative we undertake, we must have a private sector partner, a public sector partner, a philanthropy and a nonprofit. And we have just seen the power of this kind of network effect in driving big change. And you know, you talked before, I referenced the government, you know, can really do some remarkable things at scale. So, you know, you, you just have to kind of figure out what are the areas of expertise or sort of assets that aren't represented by your own organization if you're really after something. And then who do you need to put around the table as partners? And it usually is the non-obvious. And I will give you an example of this. So the National Geographic Society is 128 years old. Um, but when the then new media was coming along, which at that time was cable, okay, <laughs> they were quite concerned about getting disrupted by cable. Now, they were a venerable institution. They were doing quite well. Thank you very much. They had this magazine, but they saw where the world was going, and they knew they had to adapt. Um, and so they did a joint venture with Fox 18 years ago to deliver the National Geographic Channel. And in those 18 years, that has represented the lion's share of funding that funds all the cool stuff we love about science, exploration, and education. Um, I would not, I, I really have to tell you, I'm just not sure. Is like I, I tend to think of myself as a little out of the box, but I wouldn't have guessed that a nonprofit could align with a major media company to basically further its mission, extend its reach, and sustain its business model. And that's what it did. So we call that reach beyond your bubble in our Be Fearless work. And that means who's not at the table, who don't you know, who can really do some of those things I just talked about for you and what you're trying to do? And it's powerful. Have you found you have to fund what I call partnership brokers or collaboration managers? Now, there's one of the things I, I see, you can create a partnership, but it won't last unless somebody is there constantly, you know, sure. troubleshooting. You have to nurture these things. things. It's yeah, business exactly. development. But, I mean, it's partner management. Right. No but question. Do you, and, but do you, have you found you actually have to pay people to do that? In other words, that that's a... 
well, a, a role that we need to yes, create. Yes, yes, I can tell you way. the Case Foundation, <laughs> part of what our people are paid for is to nurture those relationships, those networks, and in some cases just even help others ideate around what networks could benefit them. So yes, I do believe you have to have dedicated resources that are about supporting the network and partners. But again, if you put your business lens on, it's a no-brainer that you do that every day. Yeah. You would never have like a network of partners and not have someone tagged with, that's your job, is to make sure that's successful. So it's really just adapting some things that we see in other sectors that are almost secret sauce items and bringing them over to the social sector. That's it's interesting. It's, it's, it, it is obvious when you say it in the private sector, but I will yeah. just say, you know, in the, in the, again, from the point of view of a nonprofit where you have programs and, you know, everybody has their dedicated role. And right. It's hard to um, realize, wait a minute, we need people who've got to be, whose job it is to put things together. And similar to the citizen thing. Yes. You know, well, because again, from business, you know, I had a stint, you know, in consumer marketing. And you know, you just would never build a product or a service without hearing from your prospective customers. But to do that, it takes intention, and it takes work, and it takes someone managing that. So if you're gonna bring citizens into the work that you're engaged in, someone's gotta be responsible for what does that look like, and what are they saying, and have we checked with them lately? So let me ask you a final question, because we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting flashed at. <laughs> So uh, just think big and optimistically for a minute and uh, talk about how you c could envisage a, a system or a society uh, where we are providing basic services for citizens, where we have innovation, participation, with government and with all those sectors. How, how, how do you see that ecosystem, if you could wave a wand and imagine a different model of citizens getting what they need uh, and a role for government and the private sector? Yeah, so this month, we're gonna, actually in the month of June, we're gonna host something called MCON here in Washington. It's a six-year-old conference made up just of millennials. And we've been funding one of, well, the largest study each year of millennials around social good and how they see sort of the world um, and addressing social challenges. And so it'll be, you know, a few days here in DC. We'll have about 600 with us and we'll have 50,000 engaged with us online. Okay, it started as a virtual conference. And so almost any subject I'm coming anywhere to talk about, I will say, it's nice we're all gathered here. It's nice we all have these ideas. But in some ways, I feel like we could get out of the way. Because this next generation, they just, I'm telling you, all the silos, all the baggage, all the limitations and reasons why not that we have, they don't see. Okay, I spent a lot of time with this generation, teaching in universities, at the Case Foundation, and all the work that I do. And I think they envision a very different world. Um, the structures don't work for us anymore. You know, we grew up in a world where there was like business, government, and that social stuff. That's not how they see it. They really don't. They don't want to even be restricted to thinking about sectors. Um, as we look at business structures today, it's quite possible that everything we know, you know, will be upended in the generations. I hope that's the case, because there is a better way to care for our citizenry, to make sure that the things we're doing benefit society, you know, and impact investing. I've said that my vision is when there's no qualifier on impact, because all investing will think about values and how people are served by it. So I'm actually really encouraged because of the time I spend with the next generation, and I think that they have the ideas we should be listening to. That's a perfect note on which to end. Join me in thanking Jean Case. It's perfect. <laughs>